Good morning. Welcome to the morning service at K Street. And we hope that as you spend time with us this morning, you'll feel really blessed and drawn close to God. What? Oh, this. Well, haven't you heard? Leicester City have got through to the FA Cup final. Not just champions in 2015, 2016, but potentially FA Cup winners this year as well. And that makes me as a lifelong Leicester fan so excited. I just want to share that excitement with everyone. But if I'm passionate about my football team, they call me a fan. But if I'm passionate about my faith, they start to call me a fanatic. I wonder why it's socially acceptable to be excited about football, but not about my Lord, who is a million times more important. My encouragement to you this morning, as we get rid of those other things, is to be passionate and excited about our faith. That's messed my hair up now. Willing to share our faith with those around us and encourage others to have the same passion that we have for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to start with a reading from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. To encourage us to draw close to God, I invited one of our former youth group members, when Anne and I used to work with uh, quite a lot of the youth group here at K Street, Annie Thomason, now Annie Skett, based with her husband Jack in Dewsbury, I've invited them to lead us in our worship time this morning. So wherever you are, do engage with this and be excited as we worship our God. Good morning, K Street. It is great to be with you this morning. Um, my name is Annie, this is my husband Jack. Hi. And uh, Trevor Elkington has asked us to lead you in worship this morning. Uh, in case you don't know me, um, I used to be part of the church. I grew up uh, with you at K Street and my mum and dad are Steve and Chris Thomason. That might ring a few bells. I know they've kept in contact with you over the years, uh, as have I with some of you. And so it's a real, um, yeah, we're really excited to be able to share with you this morning. Um, just a little update on where we're at now, because obviously I was a teenager a little while ago. Um, we are joint lead pastors at Jewsbury Elim Church over the border in Yorkshire um, and we've been here for nearly two years now and we've got two little boys Josiah who's three and a half and Asha who's uh, nearly six months and uh, yeah so we are that's us and we're going to lead you in worship this morning so please let's just uh, let's just join together and, and really um, lift up Jesus. Lord God we thank you that we get to worship you we declare that you alone are worthy of our praise. And so however we're feeling this morning, whatever our week has been like, another week in lockdown, some of us might be feeling weary and worn out, <clears throat> some of us feeling hopeful uh, that things are beginning to change. How, wherever we're at, we come to you, Lord, and we give you our hearts afresh this morning. And we want to lift you high because you are worthy and you are the same yesterday, today and forever. Even when our circumstances change, you do not change. You are faithful and you are good and you are worthy of our praise. And so we lift you high this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Strength. 
It's lovely to have Annie back here in church leading our worship. To Annie and Jack, thank you for that. If you are watching, do convey our love to mum and dad, to Lizzie, to Johnny, and the rest of the family. You know, it did occur to me while we were watching that, of a distant recollection that Annie might be a Chelsea supporter. And if that's so, my sincere apologies. Perhaps she's seen the light. Perhaps she supports Dewsbury now. We've got quite a number of notices for you this morning. You may need your diaries because they are a little bit complicated and unusual. You can always replay this if you miss anything. First of all, we are reopening our church morning services as from May the 2nd, next Sunday. The requirements and the systems will be the same as previously. You will get that via email, but in brief... That is to reserve a seat via the website or email K Street or give Jeff a ring. His number is in the directory. In which case, please leave your name, phone number and the names of anyone joining from your household. So we do look forward to that mixed economy of having people really here in church next week. Antioch is open, reminder from the Antioch team, all day Thursday and Saturday mornings, lovely selection of cards, books, including those recommended by Johnny, far better than getting them by Amazon, so do pop into Antioch for all your Christian book needs. Notice from Jay Morris, you're invited to a virtual CAP prayer meeting via Zoom. This is being hosted by Trinity Baptist Church, and both Jane and Jim, as job club manager, will provide some updates on uh, the work there, and then they'll move into a time of prayer for CAP ministries generally. So please do join that. I know I've not said when yet, I thought I'd leave that one till the end. Thursday the 13th of May, and the timing is 1 to 2 p.m. Thursday 13th, 1 to 2. Church weekend away. We're making plans to try and make the church weekend away happen this year, September 17th to 19th. It takes place in Southport. We do need to make lots of um, plans ahead. So if you are intending at the moment to come, even though we recognise that might change, um, we do need to know that. So if you could email Alan Morton, again, details in the church directory, that would be really helpful in terms of our planning. Sunday the 9th of May, our BMS mission partners, the Ovendons, who are currently on home assignment, will be sharing a message with us. It is virtual, even though they're in this country, but uh, real date for your diary, that one, Sunday the 9th of May, to hear from the Ovendons. And then uh, the Baptist Assembly online, that takes place between Thursday the 13th and Sunday the 16th of May. This year's National Assembly Uh, is just a great way for us to connect with our national Baptist family from the comfort of our own homes. Great programme of events, uh, including keynote speaker Shane Claiborne. Children's activities from a virtual Sunday school 
and excited to say that some of our own K Street young people will be involved in this year's assembly, including a contribution for worship from Vision Youth. On Sunday morning, the 16th of May, we will be joining uh, our morning service, at joining the assembly um, for the national worship celebration, and links for that will be sent out nearer the time. But if you do want to attend the rest of the event, you will need to register. Again, details will come to you via email. So there's quite a lot there, but it's great to be in a church where so much is going on. I asked Matthew Morris if he would lead us in a time of prayer this morning. So we'll hand over to Matthew for that. Let's pray together for our world. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you even though we're not physically gathered together and that you will hear our prayers, that we can speak to you and we can listen to you as though we were together. Father, as we think of our world, we think of countries where COVID is causing uh, huge problems and where they are seemingly really struggling to cope. Lord, we think of India, we think of Brazil, places where the uh, infection rate is so high and the population is so difficult to access and so large. We thank you that vaccines have been developed and we pray that you would give wisdom in the distribution of the vaccines and you would give expertise to the people responsible for that. We thank you for the success of the vaccine rollout in this country, Lord, and we pray that that would continue to go well. We pray for those on the front line working with uh, COVID patients, and we ask that you would give them stamina, you'd give them perseverance, you'd give them energy when they need it, and you'd give them the, the mental and physical strength they need. Lord, we look at our world and see so much injustice and so much pain and so much violence. Lord, we pray that you would bring peace to America, peace to those communities where injustice is not, injustice is, is frequently seen. We ask that you would bring peace, that you would bring justice to those areas. Father, in the UK, we ask that uh, you would release people from the grip of poverty. Father, there seems to be so much greed around and we ask that you would release people uh, from that, the hold that that greed has on them. We ask that you would be close to those who are poor in spirit and poor in finance. Lord, thank you for the work of charities such as CAP who are working to bring your good news to people in need. And Father, in the Rossendale Valley and close to home, we thank you for the beacons of light that the churches are in this valley. We pray that you, your Holy Spirit, would bring hope, would bring peace, and that you would enable us to share that hope we have. Father, that your Holy Spirit would give us the words to say, would prompt us, and that we would be your living beacons of light and hope in the valley. Father, knowing that you hear our prayers and that you answer our prayers, we ask these in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Matthew. And our reading this morning comes from John chapter 15, and we're going to be reading the first eight verses. John chapter 15 Verses 1 to 8. Jesus is speaking. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. 
Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As we reflect on that reading, we're going to use one more song before Johnny brings this morning's message to us, and the song is in itself a prayer. Jesus, lead us to the Father.
Lord Jesus, you are the way and the truth and the life. And we come to you this morning that you would lead us to our Heavenly Father. Holy Spirit, do work in us this morning as we lift our eyes to look to you and put our trust in Jesus Christ alone today. Amen. Well, good morning to you. It's a, a pleasure to be here again, to be speaking to you this morning on our theme of intentional discipleship. And I just want to say a big thank you to Trev for uh, planning and leading uh, th- through the rest of this service this morning and for um, uh, speaking to Annie and Jack to to uh, uh, to lead that opening part of worship for us this morning. How great is that to see uh, a former young person from K Street here now leading uh, other people in worship elsewhere in the world uh, and, and coming back to, to uh, enable us to worship today. What an encouragement that is. And uh, I've never met you, Annie, um, but uh, uh, God bless you in your ministry and Jack, where, where you are now. Well, this morning we are continuing this theme of uh, intentional discipleship. Uh, and if you haven't watched last week's message, I strongly urge you to do so, uh, as I'll be following on <clears throat> from what was spoken last week, considering what shapes us. That's what we were talking about last week. What shapes us? Because we are all being formed by something, either unintentionally or intentionally. <clears throat> so just very briefly, to summarise from last week, so we just get that picture again, uh, I asked I asked, uh, are we allowing ourselves to unintentionally be formed by the things around us, by the environment, environments that we lived in? That, that involves the stories that we believe, the habits that we fall into, uh, and the relationships that we have. Or are we intentionally being formed uh, by, in discipleship by practicing the way of Jesus That is allowing God's spirit to shape us by learning and understanding the teachings of Jesus and what the Bible has to say to us. By turning our habits into intentional practices in the way of Jesus and by intentionally building our supportive relationships around the community of God, the church made up of intentional disciples who are trying their best to practice this way that Jesus taught us to to live and to to walk in. Well, um, the goal of all of that, as I said last week, is to to form our our lives around these three three things, these three uh, goals for intentional spiritual formation. It's to reorientate our lives around the practices of Jesus and that means this to be with Jesus to become like Jesus and to do what Jesus did and it really is that simple that's what being a disciple of Jesus is all about but as I said last week that in itself is a lifelong journey a lifelong pursuit And also, as I mentioned last week, if you want to delve into further further ideas here of unintentional and intentional spiritual formation, I encourage you to go and visit John Mark Comer's teaching on this. Uh, And they dedicated a website to just this stuff called practicingtheway.org. There it is on on the screen, practicingtheway.org. And and thank you to those who got in touch with me this week, either asking me again what were those details or telling me that you've you've been looking through and listening to some of that teaching. It's really good. And uh, unashamedly, I'm talking around that this morning as we begin this new series um, uh, and into next week and as we begin this new training uh, program that I'm talking about today. So uh, check that out if you've not done already. And in this new season of a church life together, I want to lead us into a practical model as much as possible, especially as much as possible through this virtual environment, uh, into intentional discipleship, uh, which in one sense is nothing new. It's something that has been uh, taught and practiced by Jesus' disciples for over 2,000 years. Uh, and practiced down the centuries 
in many different ways in different traditions. And in another sense, this is something new because we're seeking to reimagine the practices of Jesus for our today in the places and times that we live and work now. The message and the practices of Jesus are the same, but we have to reimagine them for our current day. And so in the coming weeks, I want to introduce you to a new discipleship program I've been working on specifically for our church community uh, called Plan to Grow, (laughs) a training program in discipleship. And this isn't just about me standing up here on a Sunday morning and, uh, and teaching you uh, from the Bible, although that's, that will be part of it. But it's about us all engaging in what it means to follow Jesus personally, together and everywhere as we make Jesus Lord of our lives and in all the places that we go. And I'll be talking a bit more about that vision statement that we have uh, next week. So this programme is about uh, being intentional, as I keep saying. <laughs> Just as sports uh, men and women are uh, intentional about their discipline to, to de- their daily pursuit to, to make themselves the best and the fittest athletes they can be. And the Apostle Paul takes that sports analogy a little bit further as he, as he speaks about his own spiritual formation in Jesus when he says this to the Corinthian church. And interestingly, Corinth was a place where the games, as we know today, the Olympic Games, but those kind of games were practiced regularly. And he says this, Every athlete uh, co- uh, that competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Strict training. That's what's required of athletes. As we know, we watch it on the news and, and there's all this controversy at the minute about um, uh, should, the, should the Olympic Games go ahead? Should they have gone ahead last year? Should they go ahead this year? What's going to happen? Because the, the athletes, the poor athletes that have been training pretty much their whole lives to get to the point now where they are at the peak of their physical fitness and at the top of their game, they want to push forward because they've been training for that moment. But we as as Christians, as followers of Jesus, as disciples, also need to go into that kind of strict training to be at our uh, uh, our spiritual peak uh, all the time so that we can better know Jesus and make him known in the world that that we live in. So the point of this training program is not to be physically fitter or stronger, unless that's your thing too, you can maybe do this alongside your, your, uh, your fitness regime, whatever that looks like, but to practically learn to be intentional about following Jesus and to be intentional by making a commitment plan with others. A plan that responds to the call of Jesus to follow him And involves developing these things. A life of prayer and learning. A life investing in the lives of others, a few others around us. About being accountable to and for others. And nurturing that journey of faith and discipleship. It's about making this commitment plan to yourselves and with others. And I'm going to be talking uh, a lot more about that uh, in coming weeks and as uh, we meet to talk about these uh, in some training sessions. So the second part is to plan to grow. And that's all about the great commission that Jesus gives to his disciples in learning how how we are following Jesus' commands, not only to be disciples, to come and follow him, but to go and make disciples. But that second part is for another day. There's loads more I want to uh, talk to you about this, but this is just a taster um, of where we're heading. And today I want to start with this principle in in what it means to follow Jesus. And we talked about it um, in those three goals. The first one being to be with 
Jesus. Which means, in the words of Jesus, to remain in me, to remain within the vine. Jesus often spoke in ways that his disciples uh, could easily relate to. And here in John chapter 15, Jesus used an image that everyone could picture uh, of everyday agriculture and produce, the vine. The vineyard was a place then as it is today uh, where fruit is grown to make f- uh, food and drink for uh, the community and, 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 and produce that nourishes the body. The quality of the fruit, it always depends on the strength and the quality of the vine. If the vine is wild and left unchecked, it will not produce the best fruit. And vineyard owners who try to make the best wines will tell you that. It becomes twiggy, leggy, chaotic and unmanageable. So a gardener who planted the vine would come along to tend, to cut, to prune the vine so that it will grow effectively in the right direction to get the best produce out of it. So using this picture to, of how to understand that we, as Jesus' disciples, stay rooted within him, Jesus made some important statements here in John 15. And to begin with, he says, I am the true vine. There are two significant things going on in this very short statement. Firstly, because Jesus is again in in John's gospel making a distinctive claim that, that he is divine. That he is God. And if you don't know John's gospel very well, one important feature of that writing is is the seven I am sayings that, is, uh, uh, that Jesus says about himself that are scattered across the narrative. And each one of them reveals a diff- in a different way how Jesus declares his ministry and his divinity. He says he is the shepherd for the sheep. He is bread for the hungry. He is the way to walk, to go in. He is the gate through which we pass through into life. And here he's saying he is the vine. To the Jewish people, when they heard Jesus say, I am, well, they understood that very specifically, that Jesus was saying that he was God. Because I am, to a Jewish ear, would resonate with the Old Testament story of Moses around the burning bush, the great uh, events that led up to the Exodus, where God declares his own name to Moses when, when Moses asks for it. He says, I am that I am. So that I am uh, statement that Jesus makes is radical. It is uh, unprecedented. It is the name of God himself. And it carries significant weight and glory to it. Hearing Jesus say it about himself then is something that the religious leaders at the, at the time clearly took as blasphemy of the highest kind. But as Jesus' disciples heard it, they began and, and, and saw what he was doing in their lives. They began to realize that this was the truth. Jesus here once again deliberately uses his title, I am, to declare that he is the Son of God. That itself, the Son of God being a title he didn't use of himself, but others uh, we, we see used of him. And specifically, that he is declaring, using this imagery of farming and agriculture, that he is the true vine. And this picture is also particularly significant when we realise that the vine is also a common image in the Old Testament for the people of Israel, for God's people. Often it's used uh, of Israel to, to describe Israel's lacking or failing in some way. However, Jesus, by contrast, says that he is the true vine. 
He is saying that our belonging and our identity isn't in the people we are. It's not found in the family tree that we come from or our status in this world. But our identity and our place of belonging is found only in him. Within the vine. The people of Israel, although called by the name of God, so so often leaned into this birthright that was given to them from long, long ago as God spoke promises into Father Abraham, who became the father of many nations, and, and later through the other patriarchs. They often leaned so much into this birthright that they missed who Jesus was. We see again through John's Gospels and in the others, but but in places like John 8 in particular where Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, to the teachers of the law, to explain just this, that they lean so much into their birthright and they miss that the true vine is standing in front of them and that, that they need to remain rooted in God, in him, in Jesus, not in, in uh, their position in the world their entitled place in this world. And perhaps we as British Christians, with our own long heritage of Christianity, we sometimes do or at least have done the same. We lean into our, um, our national identity as Christians or as British or English people. However, Jesus says that none of that really matters in life, you know. What matters is that you find your identity and your place of belonging in me. Just listen to how Jesus describes that again in John 15. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. You Paul uses this phrase again and again. That we are found in Christ. Some translations use the word abide. We might be more familiar with that. Abide in me. Rest in me. Find your place in the world in me. And then Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. See the relationship there. We are connected to Jesus. And if if a person remains in me and I in them, they will bear much fruit. That's That's how we produce good things in this world through Christ and through Christ alone. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. You can't produce that spiritual fruit that Jesus talks about. You can't produce the things and the purposes of God in this world without remaining in Jesus. The whole purpose of this picture of the vine is that we produce good fruit, that we are a part of, of God's big plan in this world. As his disciples, we are found in him after the pattern of the vine. And just think about the fruit that has been produced in our own community over the years. And I'm reminded this morning here at K Street, and although, as I said earlier, I've never had the opportunity to meet Annie, Annie and Jack are the fruit of of other other disciples uh, produce of other disciples working in the lives in their lives to bring them up in the Christian faith so that they could grow in Jesus and produce fruit how exciting is that and and as uh, Trev less, uh, led for us last time Nigel led us in worship and again Nigel is the, the produce the good fruit of Trev's and other people's work in his life Paul Saxon, who has uh, again <laughs> led us in worship in this uh, time of lockdown, is another example of that. And there are many others, I'm sure, and people that you could think of who have uh, gone far and wide from this place because people have taken the time to invest in them the Jesus way. We'll come back to that idea of producing fruit in a, in a, in a moment. But whilst uh, Jesus the Son is the vine, Jesus tells us that his Father is the gardener. 
It is he who tends to the vine, and it is he who prunes and shapes it in the way that he sees fit around his purposes. He cuts back and he encourages growth. Now, while we recognise that we are entering to this new season of life together, whilst we begin to reflect back on our experiences of the last year or 18 months or so, here's something important to consider. What parts in me, in you, bear no fruit? And think about that in terms of what we're talking about here, intentional discipleship. Am I or or are you in danger of being cut off from the vine or parts of us being cut back in order for us to grow? What needs pruning back in our lives? You know, those are big questions to consider. And even more so about our church community as as we together are meant to be uh, uh, the, the people of God, salt and light in this world. And we'll talk about that again more next week. How about the life of our church? Are there areas in our, our church life that bears little or no fruit? And that God is, is pruning back or perhaps cutting off completely? Much has happened in our world and in our church this last year. I don't need to tell you that. Everything about, everything about what we have previously done has been forced to stop. This is an, a time like no other, probably in our generation. Much of that has been painful, I realise. But amongst the grief and the pain, new and different opportunities have also emerged. And so the other side of asking, what is God pruning in us? And we do really need to take the time to evaluate our own walks of discipleship and our own activities as a church. Very much we need to reassess those as we go forward. We also need to ask, in what directions is God encouraging us to grow as his community? And these are such important questions for us to wrestle with, especially for our church leadership. So please pray for us in that. So let me encourage you to engage with those questions. And you'll find those questions and ones like them in our, in our Bible study today, which is, as I say, is always available after the service on Facebook. Uh, it's posted on there. It's also, if you're watching this later on YouTube, you'll find it in the description below. Wrestle with those questions this week and going forward. Just as with Israel, it is easy for churches, when they are not attentive to God, to grow in the wrong direction. Has this time, as we have seen in history before us, has this time been a major pruning time for us? I believe that God is is calling the church to wake up. To see where some aspects of our unintentional growth has led us in the past. And then to reassess our attentiveness to Jesus again, the true vine. That is why I believe that we need this new season. This fresh start to to step into intentional discipleship with Jesus. This spring season, perhaps. To learn by first abiding in him. Abiding. Remaining. Before we can produce fruit, before we can grow even, We need to learn to abide. I said this uh, training program to discipleship is designed to be practical. So here is your first intentional step in learning what it means to remain or abide in Jesus. 
We often think of our Christian faith as a personal experience, but that was never how Jesus intended it to be. We are designed to live out our faith in community with others, in fellowship with others. That's why we talk about the up and the in and the out. Because it is not just about our personal relationship with God. It is about our community relationship with God and how we live that out in the world. So let me encourage you in this first step uh, on this uh, discipleship program to find some friends to start your discipleship journey with either for the first time or anew. Call them discipleship buddies if you like or, or whatever you want. And I want you to, I've got another name for them. I want you to, to try and form a root, <laughs> taking this picture of, uh, of the vine. Form a root. Roots are designed to be small groups of people, you know, twos, threes, fours, who intentionally choose to journey in discipleship with Jesus together. Now, the you could do this in your existing church small group if you're part of an active and thriving church small, small group. But there's a reason why I'm asking you to keep these roots groups even smaller. Traditional small groups, which are you know, usually kind of the size of 8 to 12 people, perhaps more sometimes, well, they're great environments. If you've never been part of one, I would encourage you to be a part of one uh, 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 in some way or to form one of these root groups. And those small groups made of 8 to 12 are, are great environments for finding fellowship in a, with a number of fellow Christians. They're great for discussing and studying the Bible. They're great for sharing prayer requests and, and for catching up with what's been happening in the week or in the, few, in the few weeks since you last met. However, in groups this size, it's actually hard to practice deep and accountable relationships with this many other people. You might be able to say in a group of 8 to 12, say, uh, how are you doing? <laughs> What's been going on for you the last couple of weeks? But with 8 or 12 other people, it can be very hard to share the deeper or more personal parts of your life. There may not be time. You may not want to share with everybody in the room all of those details. However, in, in smaller groups, whether it's one-to-one -one mentoring type environments, whether it's threes or fours, we have much more opportunity to go deeper, to invest in one another. And to more prayerfully and lovingly be concerned and accountable for one another. That's why when we make a plan... Yes, we begin with prayer, but the second point is that we share life and we invest in life. P-L-A-N. Prayer, life, accountability and nurture. I think that works best through these small, small groups called Roots. Now, if you're concerned about this, let me assure you, I don't think this is a new or unbiblical idea. Think about how Jesus modelled this relationship with and for his disciples. He spoke to the masses, but he chose just 12 disparate people uh, who became friends to journey together. But even within that group, notice when you read through the Gospels, that there were just two and sometimes three that Jesus taught and related to even more personally. This was often Peter, James and John. Why? Because he was able to identify and invest more deeply with the few so that that would impact, eventually impact the many. Jesus entrusted his mission to these people, his teaching um, and teaching them to obey everything that he had commanded. And through this very small group of people, and through the twelve, and through uh, those who had come to follow Jesus as their Lord, they started a worldwide movement that continues to grow today. And it does continue to grow today. 
And so then the purpose of these roots groups are to create a practical learning and accountable discipleship environment so that you can better grow, learning how to achieve those goals of discipleships, of being rooted in Jesus, to be with Jesus, as we're talking about today in the vine, to become like Jesus and to do the things that Jesus did, as we will talk about next week. And in essence, to use the picture of the vine, this is about being roots that shoot and grow spiritually and produce fruit. Multiplying. Becoming disciples who know how to make disciples. And I thought that was a catchy line. Roots that shoot and produce fruit. (laughs) But this first step doesn't need to be a huge challenge in and of itself. I want you to ask yourself, this question today, who are the, the one, two, or, th- or perhaps three friends even, I, I know around me who I could intentionally ask to share this journey with me? Maybe uh, you already have those friends. And it's just a case of asking, hey, you, I heard what Johnny was speaking about on Sunday morning. Do you want to intentionally uh, start this journey of discipleship with me? Can we become a root together? (laughs) Who could be my companions on the road? Ask yourself that. Who could be my companions on the road who I could trust and be mutually accountable in my walk with Jesus? With. But hey, I I recognise that that doesn't usually happen overnight. And if you need to, I want you to take your time in praying and asking God, what that looks like for you, who those people should be. And if you're not sure yet really whether this thing is for you or or how to engage in that, then listen out for more in these coming weeks as we begin to talk about this and share practically. Um, But I just want to offer, if you're running ahead with this, if you're you're up and going, then it's probably just worth bearing these few guidelines in in mind. And and the first thing to say is if you're a fairly new Christian, then I want to encourage you to really go for this. But to share that journey with at least one other more mature Christian, somebody who is a few steps ahead of you in their journey of faith, perhaps being a Christian a little longer, who can help guide you, but also who you can inspire I think that's a two-way relationship there. And I think three is the best number for this. But if you're already doing a one-to-one mentoring, uh, um, doing some mentoring with somebody, then that's fine. You, You can carry on with this material. And some people have asked me and suggested that they'd like to share this discipleship journey with another couple. And if you're perhaps two couples or, um, or, or, if, or if you're somebody um, who, who knows a couple really well, then that's fine too. If you're a group of two or three, I would suggest that it's probably a good idea and a wise idea to share that journey with somebody of the same sex. So, so men uh, meeting with men, boys, uh, uh, sorry, girls meeting with uh, women, meeting with women. Um, And if you've formed a root group, finally, to say, it'd be really good to know that you're intending to do this. Uh, So, well, not so that we can check up on you. Uh, I I, I just want to say that. But but so that we can be encouraged and support and encourage you uh, how best to live this out. So if you are thinking seriously about this and you've asked a few people and you're, you're there and you're ready... Uh, or in a few weeks you, you, you've got to that point, then please drop me a message and let me know if you're doing this. And, and, and we as a leadership have been considering this for a fair few months and I've, as I've been sharing the vision for this. And we feel it's important that we are doing this too. So please be encouraged that, that this is going to be a church-wide thing. This isn't a one-off. But I believe this is the beginning of something new, a new journey, a long journey into discipleship with others. And I'll be talking about 
um, this time and time again in coming weeks and months. And if you want to know more, um, then I'll be sending out some uh, in- information to the fellowship through email, an introduction to this, and an invitation to delve uh, deeper into asking questions, giving people the opportunity to ask more questions about what does that mean as we as we wrestle with with uh, what what this practically looks like in our lives. So I'll be offering some uh, Zoom training evenings. So look out for that in your inboxes. But this morning I want to uh, begin it. Uh, sorry, begin. I want to finish. <laughs> we have we have already started. Don't worry, we're getting through it. Um, I do want to finish this morning by offering some personal reflection again on this chapter that we've read today, John chapter 15, and what it means to abide in Jesus. What it means to abide in Jesus, to be with Jesus. And this is all about how we begin to find the right rhythm with life. A church leader um, founder of uh, 3DM Ministries, uh, Mike Breen, uh, says this about this passage in John 15. And he he uses an image, uh, one of many we're going to use as we explore this discipleship program together. And and, uh, he says, imagine a pendulum swinging in rhythm, back and forth, to and fro, the shape created by this swinging pendulum is a, is a semicircle, and that's one of the shapes that we'll be adding to our discipleship toolkit as we go forward. Listen out for more of those. At one end of the pendulum arc is uh, fruitfulness. Think about this passage in John 15 we've been reading today. At the other end is abiding. We can't have one without the other. We abide in Christ. And then we go forth to bear fruit. We bear fruit and then we are pruned back into entering a time of abiding. Rest, work. Work, rest. It's a divine rhythm and one we see displayed even in nature too. It is a God-given rhythm to life. Think back to the picture of the vine that Jesus gives us. Fruitfulness happens in stages and seasons. We can't always continuously be bearing and producing fruit. And there's a rhythm here. Abide. Grow. Bear fruit. Abide again. And this rhythm of the swinging pendulum is all about timing. We cannot bear fruit if we do not spend time abiding. We cannot simply stay in the abide mode. For a branch does not, for if a branch does not eventually bear fruit, it will be cut off and cast in the fire. We cannot stay abiding all the time. It's interesting that nowhere in the text of John 15 that we've read today is growth mentioned. But growth seems to be a result of the right rhythm being established. Now growth isn't the same as bearing fruit. Sometimes we mistake spiritual growth for fruit itself. But that's not the case. We must grow before we can see fruit. An apple tree, for instance, does not bear fruit for three years. Grapevines are pruned back and uh, forced not to bear fruit for two or three years so that root systems can be established. Growth must happen before fruit is produced. And growth comes from knowing how to abide. Well, all of this talk about spiritual growth and discipleship programs can all sound a bit exhausting and overwhelming. 
I appreciate that I've been wrestling with writing this so that I can present it today. But the intention is just the opposite. And as the, the pendulum swinging in the semicircle reminds us, it reminds us that discipleship to Jesus is about finding this perfect rhythm with life. From the beginning of time, God has given us a pattern for this right rhythm of life. Six days of work, one day to Sabbath. Resting out of our good work and working out of our good rest. There's much more to say on this and much, much more that the Bible has to say about this life, this rhythm to life. And we'll explore it as we consider further through our Plan to Grow program. And we'll talk more about this, the semicircle. But I want to land on these words of Jesus that Trev used at the beginning of our service from Matthew chapter 11. To remind us the kind of expectations Jesus has on us for following him. In contrast to the, to the um, expectations that, that we find the world puts on us. Jesus talks in these terms about abiding, growing, bearing fruit and abiding. And Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. You know, we often use this passage together to, um, to think about stopping and resting in Jesus. And that is true. But actually, this passage is written in the context of work. And Jesus talks about a yoke that he puts upon us. Now, a yoke is, is, a, is a kind of thing that um, you would strap across two oxen so that they work side by side to pull a plough in their work. And it was an, often an image that rabbis would use to, uh, uh, to dis, to, to their, for their disciples to kind of explain and, and uh, display the kind of mantle of learning that they would put or heap upon their disciples. When Jesus talks about this here in this passage, he talks about coming and allowing him to put his yoke upon us. And he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I want to read uh, this, um, uh, these words of Jesus from the message translation this morning, because I just think they speak to us anew and they resonate with us in in a different way from perhaps the translation we're more used to. And it says it this way. Imagine Jesus speaking this over you today as we finish. Are you tired? Burnt, worn out? Burnt out on religion? Then come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you, thinking about that yoke. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Oh, to be able to live like that in this world. We might think living up to God's standards is impossible. That there's no chance that that I can grow spiritually with all the challenges of life around me. But Jesus' way is not the world's way. In learning from him, we find a yoke like no other. He bears our failures so that we can grow in him and bear his fruit through us. May you know today the unforced rhythms of grace as you abide and grow, bear fruit 
and abide in him again. Amen. And just a short prayer. Father, we ask you to help us to commit to being your disciples. Disciples who care for one another. Disciples who change and develop and grow. Disciples who seek to be like your son. Lord, by your spirit's power, help us to grow in our faithfulness to you. Lord, this coming week, help us to know what it means to abide in you. And Lord, we ask you to send us out from this morning's service, encouraged and excited to be your disciples, your children. In Jesus' name, amen. We have one final song for you, which is entitled Build My Life, and then I'll finish with a short blessing. Sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
It's been lovely to share this morning with you. Let's go out with the words of this blessing. Arise today through a mighty strength. God's power to guide me. God's might to uphold me. God's eyes to watch over me. God's ears to hear me. God's word to give me speech. God's hand to guard me. God's way to lie before me. God's shield to shelter me, God's host to secure me. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all, this day and forevermore. Amen.